There we go. Okay, and welcome. Uh, let's get started. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Rails Online Roundtable using data in libraries. Um, my name is Dan Bostrom. I'm the Rails Member Engagement Manager. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to be turning this over to my colleague, Grant Halter, uh, Rails Data Analyst. Uh, but first, I just want to kind of go over some news and updates. Uh, Grant and I are so pleased that you can join us today. Um, Grant has been <laughs> hard at work at a lot of uh, data projects for Rails. And uh, I'm so uh, excited that I convinced him to take a break from that and share some tips and tricks. Um, I also want to note that now is a particularly important time uh, for good data practices. Um, as we all kind of know, local government budgets um, are going to be under the microscope in the next few years. And so um, we all have to work to become more proficient in how we tell a story with that data. Um, so I'm pleased that you can join us. And I think that uh, we're going to learn some things today. Um, OK, so here's how we're going to operate. Um, I'm going to do a quick uh, introductions, welcome, kind of do some news and updates. We'll get to Grant. Um, then we'll do a Q&A. We, we have some questions for you all. Um, I think that's going to be a fun time. Uh, we, we've, we've created some polls. Um, and we want to hear what you're doing, what you know, what you'd like to know, that sort of thing. Um, and then I'll do a quick wrap up and have everybody out of here by 11 o'clock. Um, again, this is going to be recorded. Uh, it will be available from the Rails YouTube page. Um, and that's going to be publicly available. So you don't have to log in or anything to access it. Um, you're also going to be given uh, an automatic email from Zoom um, that will have a link to that YouTube video. So, so please do check out that out when it comes. Okay, a couple news and notes. All right, so uh, L2 is live. Um, our presenter today, Grant, had a big part in this. Um, we're asking staff and the directors for member libraries, please log in and take a look at your profile. Um, if you don't have a profile, now is a great time to create it. Um, it's pretty easy. We just want to get you familiar with using the platform because um, we know that the sooner you log in and start playing around, um, the more comfortable you'll be with it in the long run. And that's our big, uh, th that's something we're hoping to get. Um, new things are scary, but we're here to help. Um, you can email us at help at lear librarylearning.org. That's a little bit different than what the, um, that the old um, address used to be. Um, there's a very nice help page uh, on that website as well that has documentation. Um, and there's also a ticketing system uh, f f to track requests. So um, we're excited about this. This is a, a long time in coming. Um, and uh, so please do check it out. Okay, uh, a couple other things I want to point you out to some email lists that we have available. So these are brand new. Um, we have two uh, that have been created and they were uh, created uh, based on requests from staff from member libraries. Uh, the first one is that business services list and the second one in one is passport services. Um, both of these are public lists, which means that they are available to anyone with an L2 credential. Um, so you can subscribe using uh, by logging into the Rails website with your L2 username and pass, uh, password. Um, I would highly suggest uh, signing up um, for the passport list if you attended that uh, online roundtable that we did two weeks ago with Kim Murphy. Uh, that one was great. If you haven't seen it, you can watch it from the Rails YouTube page. Um, I'm excited about that one. A lot of people, we got some good feedback on that one. And then the business services one list, uh, list is exciting too because we have a networking group that's agreed to sort of help drive conversation on that. Um, that's something that, um, that they're uh, invested in. So we're, um, we're, we're thrilled about that. Um, so again, to subscribe, head over to the Rails website, log in, and then you can find the My Email Lists option. Uh, another project that Grant is helping out with is the uh, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, Rails is partnering with the Jane Addams Hull House Museum uh, and four Illinois libraries. Um, together, we've created a virtual suite of events immersive online experiences and other avenues for participation. Uh, one of Grant's uh, uh, actions in this was to help create a forum to get people to share their stories um, or exhibit content about the women's, uh, women's right to vote. Um, we'll also be co-hosting virtual events on our Facebook page, including an event next week that's a virtual tour of the Jade Adams Hull House Museum. Um, so please do check that out. Again, you can go to the Rails uh, uh, Facebook page to find out more. Okay, last thing, and then we'll get to Grant. Uh, if you're here, you're interested in data, and I've seen from the chat that you are interested in data. Uh, so Grant did a webinar for, for us back in 2019, um, and this, is, uh, this was on Google Data Studio, uh, which is a free product. Um, and uh, just uh, something that's worth mentioning, um, it's archived for free, this webinar. Um, it's on the Rails uh, website. You do need your L2 credentials to access it, um, so you need to log in. It's about 60 
minutes. Um, and in it, Grant runs through how you can use Google Data Studio to, to uh, set up your data, easily track it, and then display it. Um, and this, this is a product actually that Grant introduced me to, um, and I use it on a regular basis. Um, I watched this webinar, I, Grant did a great job, um, so please uh, do check that out. Okay, so uh, before I turn it over to Grant, um, I have a poll question that Grant actually uh, sent me, so I'm excited to do this. All right, so the question is, I'm going to launch this here. Okay, so the question is, how involved are you with data, uh, analyzing spreadsheets, surveys in your regular work? Uh, so you should be seeing this poll right now. Um, and the options are not in job description, but love data, um, indirectly or partially in job description and want to learn more. And then the last one is primary part of job responsibilities. Um, so I'll give you about 30 seconds to fill out that poll and then I'll launch it. Um, and so that we are, I'll, I'll launch results so that we can all see it. Um, so about 10 more seconds. Okay, closing in five. Got about 90% of you voting, so that's great. Okay, all right, so we are closing the poll and I will share the results. It looks like a lot of, 65% of you said indirectly or partially in job descriptions and wanna learn more, okay? So that's good, it sounds like, um, you know, uh, not people that aren't newbies to data. Um, but, uh, but some familiarity, that's great. 25% of you said primary part of job responsibility. And then uh, just 10% of you said not in your job description, but you love data. Great, okay, stop sharing those. And then I have one more poll. And this is about data literacy. Uh, okay, so we are launching. Okay, so the question is, how would you describe your level of data literacy? The first one is casual. You work with numbers, spreadsheets. Uh, the second one is comfortable. Uh, you write surveys, create summary reports for management or stakeholders. Uh, and then the last one is advanced, in-depth statistical analysis, large data set management, and use of logic model. Uh, so again, I'll give you probably about... Uh, uh, 20 more seconds to fill out this poll and then I'll launch the results. Okay, five more seconds. All right. Okay, so the results are casual. A lot of, a lot of you said, uh, 50, over 50% 50 of you said casual. 37% uh, of, of you said comfortable. And then just 7% said advanced. So Grant, where would you put yourself on that spectrum? Um, I'd, I'd probably be hounded if I didn't say advanced. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, I'm going to stop sharing the results. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn this over to you, Grant. All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, taking those two polls. That, that kind of information is especially useful for Dan and I as we uh, go forward with more trainings and just kind of understand the, the library data landscape. Um, and before I want to get into my presentation, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show off uh, the little map dashboard that I built for the Hull House um, project. Um, it just started. Um, we only have 50 submissions, and many of them are from this National Collaborative of, uh, for Women's History sites. Um, so that's great. And you can see this map is starting to get populated, and we would love for more people to, to fill in their stories. Um, there are links on the Rails website and Halt House and all over um, to submit your form and to view this map. Um, but I wanted to start with this also because Dan mentioned the Google Data Studio. This is Google Data Studio, and I just love the flexibility it kind of gives. Um, I can click um, any item in this list and it will filter, filter down the rest of the report for me. Um, I could also pick a dot and it'll filter the rest of the report for me. So I love that flexibility for people to explore data and that's kind of all um, I'm about when I build dashboards is here's the data, I'm gonna let you explore it for, for what you need it for. Hey Grant, you know what? I'm gonna grab the URL for that form and I'll, and I'll drop it into the uh, chat box. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, that was just a little blip. Um, 
of the dashboard, I'm gonna move into presentation. Some of you may have seen this before. Um, I've tweaked it a little and shortened it for this, uh, for this round table, but I'm sure even if you've heard it before, you're in a different place with data, um, especially um, during, during the COVID times. So I hope you get something useful out of it nonetheless. All right, so I'm happy to uh, be here today um, and share some data knowledge. I'm glad everyone is interested. Um, we got a great response to this roundtable. Um, so I hope you, you, you get something useful out of this. I'd like to share a bunch of tips and tricks. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, this isn't a real Forbes article, by the way. This is just a great present I got from a former, former library that I love. Um, so my background is applied mathematics and kind of nonprofit volunteer data analysis. Um, lots of surveys, lots of large scale data analysis um, with the intent to inform decision makers and strategic planning, things like that. Um, I've worked in libraries um, for about three or four years now. I started at Oak Park Public Library as their first data analyst. That was a great experience and happy to say that that position is still around and they filled it after I left. So I'm, I'm Really glad that that's still going strong. I worked for Swan briefly, part time doing some data analysis, building some dashboards here and there for them. And now I've been at Rails uh, for a year and a half doing all the data things um, from strategic planning to data collection and everywhere in between. Um, it's been a great opportunity for me so far to get so much uh, diverse experience using data. Um, quick agenda, uh, like I said, this is going to be a short presentation, brief overview of the data analysis process. Um, and it's going to be a lot about how I think about data when I approach any of these three pieces, collecting, analyzing, and sharing uh, data. Um, I am a big quote person, so if you get nothing else from this presentation, maybe some of these quotes will resonate and you'll remember them and reflect on the work. Um, so, pretty much everyone I've worked with will recognize this quote is, is the data interesting or useful? Uh, in libraries, we know we have so much data and a lot of it is very interesting, um, but the challenge is how to make it useful. So throughout your data process, throughout your work, um, always remembering this question and asking yourself, is this data I'm sharing, collecting, is it, is it useful or is it just interesting and kind of fun to play with? Which I'm all for the fun data, but um, at the end of the day, we gotta, we got to make moves and, and move forward with, with our data. Another quote is, you can't manage what you don't measure. I think this one hits um, pretty much whatever position you, you're in. Um, in. Libraries is, if you're in charge of something, if you're responsible for, um, for policies, for programs, surveys, anything, um, you, you shouldn't expect to be able to uh, to manage that as effectively as you could if you're not collecting data and analyzing it appropriately. All right, so the data analysis process. And again, this is gonna be a quick overview just to get kind of dip your toes in, in what it's like. And it's gonna sound similar to, um, to maybe some logic model thinking that, that you may have come across in the library world, but essentially you start at the top and you have your idea or you wanna solve a problem you have a hypothesis that you need to you need to address you're planning you're setting goals um, things like that from there um, you decide what data you need to collect and you start collecting it and then cleaning it um, so where are you gathering the data the multiple sources how are you cleaning the data so it looks so it's usable to create visualizations and graphs um, and it's not not sending you wild outliers or or funky data like that um, after that, you've, you go to analyzing that data where you get to finally dig into that and explore it and find those trends and patterns and, and kind of set uh, where your assumptions were um, from when you, the planning stage to what the reality is. And then you start making decisions from that. And that's where you get to discuss, share, and act, um, where you're actually using that data, making that data useful, jumping from that interesting analyzing phase to that useful phase. What are you doing with this? Um, are you sharing it with your board? Are you sharing it with your community? Are you using it internally to make decisions? Uh, all that fun stuff. All right, so how do we determine what data to collect? Um, the key point that might be counterintuitive 
on the surface, but really makes sense when you dig into it is starting with the end in mind. Um, and a lot of people do this, but might not necessarily recognize it um, all the time, but you, before you start collecting data, you want to know where you're going with it. Um, and that can be easy to, to, to skip, especially when we have the ILS data that's already there, we have community data that already exists, is we have all this data, let's decide what to do with it from, from what it is. Um, that isn't the worst, but you really want to kind of have a, a more narrow focus so you can um, be efficient with your collection and your analysis, and you can be clear um, and direct with when you're presenting and sharing your results um, with that data. So this is, for example, this would be rather than saying, I want data to show our library needs to build a larger teen area, uh, you would instead say, I want data to help us decide if we should modify the teen area. And if so, how should we do that? Um, so that, that brings out some of the bias, which I'll, take, I'll talk a little bit about later, but really starting with an open mindset of we're going to collect data um, and we're not going to not going to push it too far in one direction. We want to collect the data and see what kind of uh, problem we can address. Um, a little bit about balancing your time with data is you, and this is definitely a work in progress for, progress for everyone. You want to kind of feel out what feels right in terms of how much time you're spending collecting data versus how useful that data is going to be. Um, so if you're spending hours, days, months just collecting the data, you have 10, 20 staff members collecting it, and the results end up just kind of pittering out. Um, that's something you really want to be aware of in this planning stage is how, how can you maximize and optimize your time in this whole data analysis process so you're not, you're not imbalanced, you're not weighing one step more than the other because um, they all build on each other and if you don't collect data um, efficiently and effectively then that will um, kind of degrade the following steps of analyzing and sharing because you won't have that solid base. So it's really important to, to keep that balance in mind. Um, one little blip about survey data population. I know census is a nice buzzword right now, um, and that actually means collecting data from the entire population, if you're aware. Um, that word doesn't come up very often, but you also, I also hear about program surveys where you want to collect um, all the data. So that difference between census and then a sample is just a subset of the population um, is key. And it's important to be wary that in these bread slices, you're not um, making broad assumptions based on a specific subset of the whole. For example, if you if you send out an email survey trying to get, trying to answer a question about your entire community or even your entire patron base, recognize that the email surveys are going to be skewed towards people who can get email and then people who open the email and then also people who read the email and then will fill out the survey. So you're slicing that 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 bread thinner and thinner um, in certain ways. And not to say that email surveys are a bad way to collect data, just be aware of how of who you're actually collecting from so that you can collect data from in other ways to kind of get closer to that hole. Uh, and that kind of leads into bias. Um, I love this little graphic about um, what the facts say is undervalued and what confirms your beliefs. Not necessarily foolish, but it can be misguided or, or underrepresented for sure, or overrepresented for sure. Um, so beginning in the process, you want to think about um, that what data will show you the full picture. Awareness is all of awareness of all context is really key here, and you want to avoid collecting or analyzing data uh, in a way that will only confirm those beliefs. Uh, you should go into the project thinking about and expecting what people who disagree with you might say, and you want to collect the information in order to kind of support your argument and back that up in, in, in anticipation. Um, bias also, uh, there, this also includes ignoring data that tells a different story than you wanted. For example, in that, in that teen, uh, building a larger teen area example, if you get data suggesting that you actually need a smaller 
teen area, but you ignore that because you personally wanted a larger one, that's, that's not great. Um, you, can, you can adjust your study or adjust your data collection to reframe, but if the data is telling you one thing, you don't want to ignore it um, and just go other ways because that will make people unhappy eventually if you make those decisions and the community is telling you one thing and you do another, that won't be great. So you have to trust that data. Um, this quote came up uh, maybe a year ago, I stumbled onto it, and I'm a little wishy-washy on it, but I think it, the message is kind of there. Bias is nothing more than the habit of making up your mind before learning all the facts. Um, I know that's definitely easy to do um, with libraries. I've fallen into that trap of, oh, I've been in libraries for however many years now. Um, I know I know what's going on. I don't need to look at the data as much. And I always come out surprised uh, is that I need to look at the data more deeply. Um, maybe I was collecting it um, inaccurately in the past, so I need to refresh that. So keeping that in mind is um, just because you have those, those preconceived notions, you've been in the library world for a long time, it never hurts to collect more data um, to kind of learn how, how the community is changing, how the library is changing. All right, so once you have all that data, um, you're gonna to wanna to start analyzing it. And this is kind of the fun part. The part is just exploring what's happening because it really, really gives you all the answers if you know, if you know where to look. And the phrase analyze data can sound kind of ambiguous, like, oh yeah, you just look at the numbers and see what's happening. But um, the general approach is relatively uh, simple. So here, another quote, love my quotes. Gathering data is just one, is just step one of a oh, little typo. This is just step one of the data-driven strategy. The real work comes in sorting through the data to decide what to include and what to disregard or deprioritize. Um, so that's a big one because like we said in libraries, there's a ton of data and the key is figuring out what is useful and what is just interesting. So um, I always like to call it fluffy data. Um, I don't like fluffy data that is just kind of a filler. It's just there. It doesn't necessarily like drive home the point or help tell the story. Um, so really being intentional about what data you're collecting and, and using to, to tell your story is important. All right, so trends and patterns, this is, this is kind of the, the meat and potatoes of data you're looking for. I say increases and decreases in activity usage as an example, but essentially you're looking for change um, or also lack of change um, can also be interesting. Um, for example, if your library is planning to add fine free or auto renew policies, many staff might expect um, emptier shelves or hold ratios being more difficult to manage. Um, but what happens when after six months of the new policy, you see the holds have had little to no increase, not the hold ratio, just the holds have been increased. And that's useful information because that, that was different from what, what you assumed the problem might be. Um, so it's not, it's not bad data collection, it's just you're reframing how you're solving that, what was perceived a problem is, okay, hold stayed flat, that's good news in one way that you're saving on your budget, um, you didn't have to, you don't have to spend as much, but that also might mean your patrons are, are using more unique ut materials that were already on the shelf, um, rather than asking for multiple copies of the popular stuff. So that's one example um, of change. You're looking for those trends and patterns that can go across timelines, that could go across um, of collections. Maybe some are different, are, are, some are uh, performing differently than others. So you can dig into those different variables about what about this collection is performing differently. Is it in a different location in the library? Did it have a big new purchase recently? Um, who's the target audience in your community? So looking at all those different variables, um, you can uncover what, what is actually going on. Ebook and audiobook um, informing your purchasing patterns. Rails is about to do a large, uh, large study with our, our e-read um, data about how we're purchasing and how we're managing hold ratios and what, how can we better serve um, the patrons of that, that service. So we're digging into all kinds of different um, metrics and, and 
variables to, to try to figure out what actually is happening because maybe our, our perception um, with purchasing, we've been informed after 10, 20 years of doing it, um, might be informed one way, but the data might pull out 20% unique, uh, unique patterns that, that can be useful. Now I'm going to jump to outliers. Um, this is scatter plot. If uh, you've, if you're familiar, I love scatter plots. They um, essentially compare two metrics one to one. And this is this graph itself is of population versus operating budget of Illinois libraries in uh, in Rails and Illinois Heartland. And you can see right off the bat which dots. Um, are outliers, which ones are kind of out of the clump, which are out of that general cone um, where, where you wouldn't expect them. And, un, and outliers um, have a bad reputation sometimes of being data errors, which they absolutely can be. They also can be useful. If they are data error, that tells you right off the bat you had some error in your data collection um, or you misinterpreted data collection or you had a typo and you can go back and fix it really quickly. And that's Graphs like this help you see that um, really quickly. Um, but they can also, if you are one of the, the outliers, you can use it as a point to advocate for your library. I know one of these dots recognized that a board member um, saw that their dot was, was away from the, the mean or they were, they were kind of separated from the cluster of who they perceived as their peers in terms of population budget. And they used this to advocate to their board that they should increase funding to, to be on par with the rest rel relative to their population. Um, so there's all those little pieces that if you frame it the right way, um, it's not manipulating the data in a kind of a mischievous way, but you can use it, kind of prove your case and, and support your library. Um, other general stuff, people using spreadsheets to organize, sort, filter, visualize your data. Um, I love all of that and Excel is the popular one, but I, I encourage you to look at other spreadsheet services like I use Google Sheets often because they have different formulas here and there that help you um, string the data together or help you identify different pieces or organize it if you have a Google Form can bring into Google Sheets and that connection is really simple um, for people that don't have a lot of a lot of data experience. And I don't mean to be be promoting Google so much, but I just use a lot. Um, so how do you analyze data? It's easy to get lost in all the data um, when you only need a couple pieces to tell your story. Um, and that is so true. I, I can't stop pushing that hard enough is there's a lot of data in libraries and the challenge is to, to figure out what, what pieces do you actually need, narrow it down, narrow the focus, because if you have that, if you have an audience that is expecting um, certain outcomes and you give them six things that aren't related, they're gonna get lost and not be able to follow the pieces that actually are gonna help tell you your story. And that quote was probably a little misaligned in my PowerPoint. I apologize for that. So this is a quick example of how you can use spreadsheets more effectively. A lot of people might take this and sort it and just kind of gauge based on the numbers. 88,000 is there, there's 17,000 there. Um, but that might not click with everyone's brain. So I love heat mapping the data and you can instantly see um, the differences between um, the two but between the two uh, lists here you can see where the highs are how high the high is relative to the middle and also how the lows are um, in this graph blue is high yellow is lower so um, I use this almost on every single project every single day um, just a quick heat map of my data will tell me how these two pieces are related and and uh, what, where to go forward, where to find those outliers, and where to find those trends that I might not have been able to see in a regular sort or, uh, or just kind of glancing through the data. Um, back to this is a little bit about bias to um, causation versus correlation gets a lot of buzz. Um, and 
It's related, like you could see that related to seasonal shifts, data anomalies, policy changes. There's a lot of non-library events that can skew your, your data that might be easy to pull out, um, like the eclipse, but it might not actually have been the true cause of whatever data you're looking at. Um, so I love this graph. There's a whole website of 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 these causation versus correlation graphs and you can see the worldwide commercial space launches versus sociology doctorates awarded align pretty closely if you set the graph just so um, it would you could interpret this as one causes the other but as we can just kind of think through logically is those things are not related um, so this can be a little more confusing when you have all library data and it's a lot easier to imagine that one piece of the library impacts the other but it's really it's really important to be careful when you make those assumptions um, and just one bit about this graph is it's using a dual y-axis you can see on the left it says launches 30 45 60 on the right it says degrees awarded Dual axis graphs aren't great um, because they are prone to showing this, this causation versus correlation issue because you can set those can set those axes at whatever numbers you want. So it lines up as, oh, it's always increasing or always decreasing. Um, so just be careful when you're when you're creating those visualizations um, of those kind of easy to fall into traps. Um, that might confuse your audience or confuse you when you're analyzing that data and kind of lead you down uh, a funky path. Uh, and of course, visualizing data is very important. Um, it can be hard to build visualizations, but it can be really easy to just throw your data in Excel and they'll give you the default. Um, but everyone is constantly recognize, but everyone can constantly recognize the visual appeal when a when a graphic is good. Even the people that are like, ew, data, I don't like it, will look at a nice visualization and say, ooh, I, I want that. And that's that makes a big difference for people. Um, whether it's a dashboard or a graph or a spreadsheet, um, finding the right combination of data accuracy and visual clarity is a great accomplishment. And um, finding that balance is, is kind of the goal. Um, I will highlight uh, Ann K. Emery did a number of different data visualization podcasts or webinars um, hosted by Rails. They're in the Rails archive. I cannot recommend those highly enough. Um, I am still learning plenty about data visualization. Um, and I can tell you that all of her graphs and her, her, her talks give you uh, a lot of confidence and a lot of great tips and tricks to just flip your graphs from the generic to something that will that will be highlighted in in your presentation um, simple things is how to label how to highlight um, pieces that are related to your story and kind of gray out like this little green line and this graph is uh, don't worry about that just pay attention to the the story that we're trying to tell um, removing the clutter and highlighting those pieces that drive your story are important. So I won't dig into visualization too much. Um, I'll just push you towards those Ann K. Emery uh, webinars. All right, how do we use our analyzed data? So this is the presentation, this is the sharing part, and I'm gonna go back to again, is this useful or interesting? This applies everywhere. So if you have this data, is it going to be useful to your audience or just interesting? And when I say useful, I mean, is it, in other words, going to be actionable for your audience? Are they going to take it and really digest it and understand what's going on? Uh, and you really want to pay attention to who that audience is from the beginning, um, but also once you've actually analyzed that data, you want to recognize who you, what's the, the level of data literacy you're, your audience has are they advanced are they beginners and really really tune your visualizations to that um, also what are their goals is it the board is it your director managers librarians the community you can visualize the same data in different ways to to uh to get a better response from your audience so it'll resonate with them and they can go out and say that they learned um, 
they learn something from your from your information. That all kind of comes into the balance of confidence in your data versus the impact of the decision. Um, so you, I love this little grid um, when you're thinking about your project or presenting your projects. If you have high confidence in your data and it's gonna be a large, you perceive it as having a large impact, do that project. Um, and on the other side, if you have low confidence in your data and it's low, low impact, you probably don't want to spend your time on that. You probably want to move that into um, kind of other resources. You got high confidence and low impact for your project. Um, can you turn that into a larger product? Can you gather many small projects and pull them into something bigger to kind of tell that larger story? And then I'd be very cautious if you have low confidence in your data for a project that is going to have large impact because that is just, uh, that's, a, a little dangerous place to be uh, with, with your data. You're just asking to be to be questioned and not trusted with with all those results. For example, if your survey only has a 10% response rate, how comfortable are you making a larger decision about the future of that program or a series of programs? Um, telling your story with data, uh, it's often the case that the person doing the work of the collecting, analyzing, sharing the data is the most passionate and knowledgeable um, about that, about the data. So your enthusiasm is great um, and it will shine through, but if you can't translate the meaning to your, your stakeholders, your managers, um, then you're going to miss a great opportunity with that passion. Um, so you really want to think about who you're presenting to. Um, you can imagine a discussion about, about uh, e-read circulation data going differently from your board to your manager. So really be intentional about what you're saying and who you're saying it to. Another bit about Ann K. Emery. Love it. All the things. Check out those webinars. Um, dashboards are more of an art than a science. I was talking about that balance of, of, of data uh, with visualizations of data and art. Dashboards are tricky. It's easy to, to clutter the dashboards and put too much on it. So it's better to have less than more, especially when you want to focus on your story. Um, I showed the, the Hull House Museum dashboard before and that one wasn't focused on telling, uh, it was telling many stories. Um, so I didn't necessarily need to highlight one or the other. So I just kind of dumped everything and let the user explore the way they wanted to. Whereas if you're trying to build a dashboard to, to, for your board to help them make a decision, you really want to highlight different pieces and you don't want to clutter it with a lot of fluffy data that will kind of distract them or they'll be able to pull it out and play devil's advocate, advocate against. Um, and highly recommend Google Data Studio. If you're just a beginner, it's easy, um, pretty, pretty straightforward to use. So that was my quick hits of tips and tricks for the data analysis process. And I think I will stop there. I had a little bit about logic modeling, but that might come up in the questions. So I'll go back to you, Dan. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Grant. And and we do have a uh, one question. Um, so so what we're going to do here is uh, we'll get, we'll do your questions uh, as an audience, and you can put those directly in the chat box. I don't think we're going to use the Q and A section this time, um, but you can put them directly in the in the chat box. And then uh, we have some questions for you, but we'll save those to the very end. We have about twenty minutes, so we do have time to do a, a healthy discussion. Um, thank you so much, Grant, for uh, saving me uh, that time. Uh, but first, Grant, I have a question directly for you. Uh, it's from Kate. I'm so much more comfortable with Excel and sometimes can't find similar functions in Google Sheets. Do you have uh, any resources that you recommend for learning more uh, with a specific focus on data analysis? I know there are a lot of general Google Sheets trainings, but something more specific would be helpful. And, and I will also say that if, if anyone in the audience has, a, has an answer to that question, please provide, you know, please feel free to chime in uh, in the chat box and, and answer that as well. We would definitely welcome that. Yeah, absolutely. So what I found myself doing with a lot of data analysis in libraries is things like those heat maps, um, that heat map fun functionality in Excel of just coloring the numbers a little differently. Um, so I use that in, in Google Sheets and Excel. 
uh, of course, but finding the different visualization to look at the data more than just in a table of numbers um, going up and down kind of takes it to the, to the next level. Um, for if you're in Google Sheets or Excel, what I kind of use them pretty equally. Well, because Google Sheets uh, connects to Google Data Studio so simply, I usually just dump my data in Sheets and do the actual analysis in Data Studio. So in that visualization tool, it's a little easier to format those tables or those graphs to, to find those outliers, to find those trends. And once I've found those trends, then I can go back and review which, which fields um, are interesting, which variables are, are poking out. Um, I don't have any specific training to go deeper off the top of my head. Um, Anne K. Emery, can't say that enough. Yeah, and, and I just want to put a note that I did put in the link to that simple spreadsheet state analysis techniques and time saving secrets. Uh, that mm -hmm. is a Rails webinar. You do need to log into L2 from uh, use your L2 login to access it. Um, and then I think she has an, I, she's done a ton of, uh, she's done a bunch of them. For us. I think there might be two more and at least one of them is about dashboarding and that yes. was phenomenal. Yep, yep. Kate says she's the bomb. <laughs> she she is the bomb. Oh yeah. Uh, okay, awesome. Um, and uh, thank you, Elizabeth says I watched that webinar. One of the best I've ever watched, and she has her own blog. Yeah, <laughs> she's she's great. She's great. We've been so fortunate to have her speak, and um, I think we, you know we're we're all trying to create a. Uh, Grant has done a great job of of, of leading us in creating a, a and I think he calls it a, a culture of good data practices. And, um, and you, uh, you know, I would say that using Anne's webinars as a, as a way to also sharpen your skills is, is good. Uh, I mean, in the long run, I think you need to, a lot of people, and, and myself included, you have to play around with it. You, you really have to, you have to dedicate yourself to, to using it and using these tools. Um, otherwise, you're just, it's not going to, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to pick up on it like that. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll say that a lot of people learn different ways. I definitely am someone that learns from using the tool and just throwing data in and playing around with the buttons, um, which is why I probably don't have a book or another training webinar to, to suggest. Um, okay, great. Uh, and actually, I, I want to ask, I'm, I'm just going to jump ahead and ask this question, and this is for uh, our attendees. Um, we want to hear from you, um, and you can still ask questions of Grant. We have we have him here for the next, uh, until the end of the, the hour, so uh, please do ask him questions. But this is a question for you, uh, and it relates to Kate's question. What data tools have you found most useful or helpful to learn, manage, analyze, present data, and why? Um, so uh, again, I've put, I put that in there. You can see I put it in as Q1. It says which... Uh, uh, which data, if you would answer with A1, that would sort of help us track your results or track those, those answers. Um, so, um, so, you know, when you, when you type in your answer, just click A1 and then, and then, and then your answer, and that will sort of help us uh, uh, track it. Um, okay, I, I do have a question while people are answering that. Um, I do have a question here uh, from Elizabeth. It says, speaking of that, if we don't use a lot of bigger data sets in our jobs, how do we play around with it? Where can we get data sets that allow us to play around? That's a great question. That is a great question. I will share my screen again. Oh, maybe I won't. Yeah, well, let me stop. Hold on. Okay. okay, there you go. <laughs> share my screen. So I think IPLAR is is a great data source and i'm building tools right now you're looking at it now to make it easier for for libraries to get access to that data and kind of have that jump start rather than just getting the big data dump um, in excel to having useful data so this was this is just a google data studio dashboard that i threw in 2019 iplar data into and just started exploring um, you'll see i made a few different uh, scatter plots of common, common, common data. So that's kind of what I explore with is this IPLAR data because it's definitely interesting. There's a lot of funky things going on in the library world, and this this data helps find out um, how data collection is, where the data error is popping up, and kind of what are these trends? Is it um, you can kind of see in this, is there a wide cone? Is there a wide difference between these libraries based on these metrics or is it narrow? So IPLAR um, is a great piece and it's a great piece to advocate for your library too. If you're talking to your community or talking to your board, I gave that example before of a library using 
um, using this exact map to find their dot and say, oh, we find our peers are actually up here. So we're gonna use this to talk to our board and say, we hold ourselves to a higher standard. Let's, let's get closer to, to, to the other libraries we wanna be with. So this was population operating budget, another fun one that if you're trying to, maybe not everyone's building new building during pandemic, but this could be an interesting one of your population versus the square footage of your libraries. And you can see there's a unique spread. There's kind of clusters out here. Maybe those are older buildings. Maybe there's kind of a trend of in the last 20 years, more li new libraries have been built. So they're kind of popping up the curve. So there's a lot of interesting stuff. Um, once you dig into who these dots are, you can kind of Put the pieces together of oh are they a suburb are they rural um what's their what's their their village or city structure um that you can you can pull in once you find that that outlier dot or if where you find your dot you can explore more um it's another one and then i want to show this one because i thought it was a little silly this is libraries by population and the number of meeting room uses they have and I would suspect that this library might have had a typo in their data entry. I don't want to <laughs> highlight them to embarrass them or anything because there's plenty of data errors from all libraries. I promise you that. But this one just kind of sticks out visually is that I might not have found that dot if I was just looking through a spreadsheet um, the same way. And that's, you can't miss that. And that's what I like about these, these graphs especially is you see um, it messes up the rest of my graph, of course, but I can see what's going on and maybe maybe uh, contact them to help if they, if they need help with their data maybe, entry or just remind them of the typo. <laughs> maybe they just do a ton of meeting rooms. Maybe. <laughs> I, I've heard rumors that they only have three they only have three meeting rooms in their library, so that would be really impressive to have <laughs> 250 reservations of, of an hour or something like that. Okay, I want to get to some of the answers that I'm seeing on here, and and uh, and I love this. Uh, okay, so we're getting a lot of Excel, as you as you would guess, um, and uh, people are saying, uh, you know, they they uh, they like that they can find ways to use it. Um, you know, they like that it ties into other Excel pro or other Microsoft products. Totally get that. Um, one person said uh, Microsoft Access, um, and uh, and I think that they say just an easy way to collect and store. Love that. Um, uh, another person said, they said Google Drive, Sheets and Docs, but they also said Facebook has a tool for the data called create, uh, called Studio, or Creator mm -hmm. Studio. Uh, I've never heard of that before, but I love it. Um, uh, let's see here. Someone said, I've, I've liked Excel, Tableau, et cetera, um, but something that gave me a couple more ideas was looking through Canva templates and just to make it more stamp. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sheets and Excel. Um, Let's see here. Someone asks, do we have access to this IPLAR recap? <laughs> once, once I make it prettier, I will give everyone access. Because obviously this is public data. I'm just trying to repurpose it so it's more accessible. Also have previous years of IPLAR data to add into this, which will be a lot more fun too. So I, I'm, I'll do a little plug. I'm actually doing a presentation at ILA about data. It's the only, only presentation with data in the title. So if you just do a quick search for that <laughs> word you'll find it i think we're on thursday at 1 30 um talking about data and i anticipate having this ready by then so stay tuned for that thank you amanda for already signed that up that's great um so my goal is to have this tool functional by that to kind of do do a demo during that that presentation and then send it live so everyone can can use it um, okay, I, you know what, I'm going to, since we have 10 minutes left, I want to do a poll, um, because we have a poll question for you, and um, this is about barriers. Uh, okay, so I'm going to launch the poll, okay. Uh, so the question is, uh, what are the most significant barriers to you using data more often or in more advanced ways? Uh, not enough time, not sure where to start, lack of financial resources, uh, lack of staff managing support and other. And if you do have an other in that um, category, just uh, type it into the, um, type it in the chat box um, and, and we'll know that you, you, with maybe like an A2 in front of it and we'll know which, what you're talking about. Um, so I'll give you uh, let's I'll give you thirty more seconds to answer this one and and still if you have questions for Grant you we can still ask them um, whoops uh, just make sure that uh, you put them into the the chat box and we'll we'll see them.
All right, about uh, 10 more seconds here. <laughs> Jennifer says all, all of the above. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's okay. That's good. We should have put it in all of the above category. That's a missed opportunity, but oh, oh well. Um, okay, I am closing it. Well, we're still getting a couple more people answering. I'm going to close in 10 more seconds now. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, all right. And showing the results, uh, a lot of people said not sure, uh, either not enough time or not sure where to start. Those seem to be the real clear leaders um, out there. So um, um, not so much lack of financial resources or support, just um, not enough time now, we're not sure where to start. Um, also want to acknowledge uh, Donna saying not my primary responsibility, more of a no one else wants to do it. <laughs> and I enjoy it when I can. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes uh, that, I think the time thing um, can be a big, big, big hurdle. So, yeah. Thank you everyone for answering these polls. They're, they're really useful um, for us to, to know where, where kind of the library world is. So we can, we can plan future, future trainings, webinars, data visits, uh, all kinds of things. Thank you. Hey, Grit, uh, we had a question come in through the Q&A box. Uh, one of my staff suggested R for visual graphs. I'm not sure what that is. Any thoughts or knowledge on this? Did you mention and I missed? I don't really know anything about it. I haven't mentioned R in this presentation, but I personally use it. It's, it's, definitely, a, it's definitely an advanced level tool. It's, it's kind of a coding tool. I could show it off a little bit real quick, okay. but it's... You wanna... Nothing is pre-made for you, which some people like, some people don't. It's it's all coding. Yeah. Um, so if you have an interest in coding, actually some decent trainings um, that I could share if anyone's specifically interested in learning how to use R. Um, and the benefit is once once you've kind of created that code, you just re-upload your data, recycle your code, and it'll update for you. Um, and you can do really fancy statistical analysis if you want, but you also can kind of, you can build dashboards through it. You can build visualizations, you can manage your data, you can combine data. Um, it's a little easier. Like when I have large data sets in the tens, hundreds, millions of rows, I bring it into R because it can handle that size, um, uh, the size of files. And that's where I, I clean my data most often where I'm, I'm bringing in multiple data sets and I have to standardize uh, their, their, their forms or their, their format or their, their kind of field, field names um, or change formats. If I'm doing a large scale, I bring it into R. Um, I haven't gotten too deep. It could be a full-time, it is a full-time job for a lot of fancy data analysts. I bring it in for some pieces that I definitely used it when I worked at public libraries um, to pull in those large data sets. Um, but I use it from, it's really useful for ILS data because you have that large volume, a lot of fields, a lot of rows. If you're doing all transactions in a year or multiple years, it can, Excel will explode if you, if you um, are a little too finicky with it. But bringing things into R, um, it can do that analysis or it can just clean your data so you can bring it back out into Excel to visualize or, or analyze there. Um, it's got a reasonably high learning curve. So um, if you, I would recommend it for people that have some extra time, if you want to do it off work to get the extra skill, highly recommend it. Um, but it's, it's definitely leaning towards kind of professional math statistics people, but I know plenty of amateurs that just kind of use it on the side and I kind of consider myself an amateur in it. Um, but yeah. It's a great, great tool, great resource if you want to get a little more um, creative or sandboxy um, than just the standard default tools. So Elizabeth asks, excuse me, Elizabeth asks, can you do the same, the, can you do sort of the same thing using macros in Excel? Yeah, you can. Yeah, that's essentially what it is. And let's, let's try a little live demo here. Yeah, and you know what? While you're doing that, I'm gonna launch because we have like we have like five minutes left. I'm gonna, okay. and this is great because it, it it can I think it connects really nicely with our third question. Um, mm -hmm. So the question is, what future dating 
what future data training topics would be most useful. So uh, if this is something you want to know more about, um, let us know. And, and again, please use the A, um, A3 to answer the question um, and make sure that you choose two pan all panelists and attendees in the option so that uh, everyone can see your answer. Mm -hmm. I would be happy to nerd out with anyone who wants to learn R or just have me show off my R thing. So this, you'll see this is the script. Um, so I wrote it once and I'm just going to highlight it and click run and it's going to go through installing different packages here and there. This is the data set that I have just saved in an Excel file essentially or a CSV. Um, and it's going to create a graph and I forget a little bit what this graph is. So we're going to see and hope it's not anything personal. I don't think it is. I think it's just a graph of Illinois. So it's running, it's running. Depending on your data size and what, what packages you're installing in, it might take a little longer here and there. You could probably answer or go over the results if you want right now, Dan, while it's running. See, it's working on the side. I'm not touching anything, just doing its magic. Yeah, so I'll just mention a couple of uh, responses we're getting from this. Uh, Kate says, how specifically how we can present a data dashboard for meetings, for board meetings with key stats. Someone says, just uh, Google Sheets and Data Studio. Um, Elizabeth says, more of this, but as a demonstration, like you're doing now. Okay. Um, Cindy says, actual showing of info and how it is put into a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet is populated. Uh, using data to create pretty and useful annual reports for boards. Uh, taking the data from the gathering stage to the reporting stage, more of a workshop, stuff like that. Um, yeah, put perhaps a session where you take one data set and show it to use different resources to process and analyze it. Ooh, okay. to, do a, to do a heat map. I like that one. Wow, we're getting a ton of responses. Love the heat maps. <laughs> so just real quickly, this is the code. I created a map of Illinois, which also might be available soon by the ILA presentation. So this is a map of public library service areas. Um, you can see they've got little highlights. I can click on it and it'll tell me which one it is. So I built this in R. I had some data. I colored it by what resource, uh, by what? Shared catalog. Shared catalog they use, yeah. So SWAN is in orange, CCS in blue, et cetera. So this is just a small example of things you can do in R. You can build maps really easy. You don't need another fancy tool. You can do all that data cleaning and analysis and stuff. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, okay, uh, just a couple other answers that, that I wanna note. Um, a conversation about what KPIs and other bits of data people actually use for local decision making. That's a great one. Um, thank you, Amanda, for that. Um, how to take census data. Oh, you know what? A couple of people mentioned census data. Uh, using census data to, uh, to like map uh, geographic boundaries and see which uh, library districts and school districts and things don't match. That's a, yeah. that's a fantastic one. Um, specific anecdotal experiences of when a librarian applied data to influence a successful decision. Oh, okay, yeah, just case studies. I like that a lot. Um, so these are all fantastic uh, answers. We are going to take these um, and, and I'm going to make sure that Grant gets a chance to see all of these uh, answers and, and keep them coming. But we are very much at the end of uh, our hour. So um, I'm going to close this up here. Um, and I'm going to say, Grant, thank you so much um, for, for this. Uh, this is wonderful. Um, if you all, all are attending um, ALA, or ALA, ILA, uh, the ILA virtual conference, uh, make sure to sign up for Grant's sessions there. Um, and uh, we will, you know what, we're going to do our best to try to offer more of these. Um, and especially uh, we're going to, now that L2 is uh, out there and live, I'm going to try to rope Grant in to do uh, a couple more of these. And maybe we'll get a presenter from a library to talk about what they're doing at their own um, sessions as well. So um, Grant, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, um, thank you everyone for coming and, uh, and uh, to make sure to check out, uh, we'll have a, a email coming from Zoom for you tomorrow, which have a link to this recorded session. Um, and, uh, and yeah, have a great day. Have a great Thursday. We'll see you later.